once the transmitter's been released and diffuses across that synaptic cleft, we have to, at some point, remove it. Right? So it's going to go across. It's going to affect that postsynaptic membrane. But we want to be able to remove that transmitter. And it turns out there are a number of ways that the transmitter can be removed. Sometimes there are enzymes that are in the cleft. I think my other diagram shows that. No, it doesn't show. But sometimes there are actual enzymes right here in this cleft that can break the transmitter down. So what if I told you there was an enzyme found in that cleft that was called colon esterase? What do you suppose it would work on? Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, right? A long name would be acetylcholine esterase. So sometimes there are enzymes that are right there in the cleft that can break the, the transmitter down. Sometimes the presynaptic membrane will pull the transmitter back. Okay? So sometimes this presynaptic membrane can actually actively transport the transmitter back into the synaptic knob. Turns out there's a group of drugs that are out there right now for, happen to be, and I don't care that you know this, but happen to be used for treating <clears throat> depression, and they're called serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So what do you suppose they do? Inhibits. Pretty obvious, right? They, they inhibit the reuptake of serotonin, an important transmitter, so that it can't be sucked back up. It leaves the serotonin at the synapse. If you leave the serotonin there for a long time, you continue to stimulate that postsynaptic neuron, and you get changes in nervous system activity. Uh, so sometimes the transmitter is taken back up by the uh, presynaptic membrane. <coughs> and it, it says sometimes they diffuse away. It also turns out sometimes glial cells, neuroglial cells, can pick up the transmitters and remove them. Okay? So it can diffuse away, but there also could be glial cells that can pick up the transmitters and remove them. So let's take a look at the, the transmitters. And it turns out, folks, as I mentioned already, the first transmitter ever discovered was acetylcholine. Since that time, there's been many, many more transmitters that have been discovered. They continue to discover more and more transmitters. You know, we estimate that in the brain, there are 30 trillion synapses. I, again, I don't care that you know those numbers, but 30 trillion synapses. I don't know what that number means. It's, I know it's huge, right? The synapses are your switches that are in the brain making things work. And the transmitter is what actually does that, right? So 30 trillion switches working in your brain to control what you're, you're doing, and the transmitters are what are critical at those switches. So we've discovered many more transmitters. They continue to discover more transmitters. We're going to hit the major ones. <coughs> so acetylcholine, I mentioned already. A, a group of chemicals that we call monoamines. Guess how many amines? groups they have on them. One. One, right? And you can see them in here, right? So here's the amine group. So the monoamines, the monoamines actually include a subcategory that we call catecholamines, dopamine, norepinephrine, and then I put epinephrine with a question mark because epinephrine, there's some controversy of whether or not we should really consider it to be a neurotransmitter or a hormone. But we'll, we're going to consider it kind of a neurotransmitter here. Um, I'm not going to ask you to recognize these. I didn't make it so I can blow it up here. I do think it's kind of interesting to look, though, just for a minute. Here's dopamine, right? And here we can see dopamine's been changed into norepinephrine. And if you look closely, the only thing that's happened is we've added an OH here, where the H was. And to change norepinephrine into epinephrine, all we have to do is add a methyl group to the amine group. So again, remember we kind of talked about this with steroids, a very slight change in the chemical structure, and you change the ability of that chemical to attach to receptors, and it changes what it's going to do, in this case, in the nervous system. So we have these catecholamines, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and then another monoamine is one, uh, a transmitter that I just mentioned, serotonin. Um, since I mentioned uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, there's a, a group of very old drugs. They've been around for a long time for treating depression. They're called mono.
amine oxidase inhibitors. Mayo inhibitors. Any of you ever heard of these? Mm -hmm. They're an old group of drugs. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So what do you suppose monoamine oxidase does? Breaks down monoamines, right? And so again, if you inhibit that enzyme, you keep the monoamines there for a longer period of time, you're able to get more activity at the synapse than you normally would get. Uh, some amino acids are able to function as neurotransmitters. One called glutamate, and then here are two amino acids that work as inhibitory transmitters. Uh, they're inhibitory transmitters, GABA and glycine. I'll tell you what GABA stands for, you don't need to know it, but it's gamma amino butyric acid. GABA is fine if you just know GABA. So GABA and glycine are inhibitory transmitters. Here's something that I think will surprise you. The transmitter that's most commonly found in our brain, GABA, an inhibitory transmitter, is the most common transmitter found in your brain. Pretty interesting, right? So here's, the, it, it's most important really then if you think about that, that we inhibit synapses rather than actually stimulate them. We're constantly being bombarded by lots and lots of impulses. Since I mentioned GABA here, what if I told you that uh, alcohol is able to keep the GABA at the receptor for a longer period of time than it normally would be? Does that make sense? Right. See, when I, I mention these drugs and things like alcohol, think about it for a minute, folks. The switches of your brain are the synapses. And if you change the activity of the switches, what have you done? You've changed your behavior, right? You've changed your behavior. Um, amines, I already mentioned acetylcholine, but another one, histamine, is a neurotransmitter. Uh, certain polypeptides are transmitters. The enkephalins and endorphins, you've probably heard of endorphins, these are, are transmitters. Some gases, such as nitric oxide and carbon monoxide, work as neurotransmitters. Now that's not nitrous oxide, it's nitric oxide. So these are neurotransmitters. And then, did I include on your handout the endocannabinoids? No? Yes? yes, yes yeah. Yes, so, yes. Uh, so there's a group of neurotransmitters that we call the endocannabinoids. Why does that word sound kind of familiar to you? <laughs> Cannabis, right? So, you know, folks, if you think about the synapses being the switches of your brain, it should, should uh, surprise you to learn that drugs that interact with the nervous system have to interact by changing the receptors or the transmitters that are in the brain. And the reason that cannabis has an effect on the brain is that you already have a group of transmitters that we call the endocannabinoids. And when you sm smoke cannabis, right? Smoke, smoke weed, okay? Uh, uh, that the chemical is able to bind to the receptors that you normally have anyway, and it causes the changes in the nervous system that you would see. Uh, so what does it do? Does it stun it, or what does it do? So transmitters, whatever the drug is, attach, and they are able to stimulate those receptors and cause the changes that you would normally have from the endocannabinoids that you normally produce. So when uh, morphine was discovered, eventually they figured out that morphine fits into specific receptors for morphine. All right, uh, so 